Uh, Dr. Greg, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so I just thought I would give some comments about kind of what, what a potential off ramp might look like and what kind of barriers to ending this conflict, at least in the near term. And I think in terms of an off ramp, usually when we talk about ending a conflict, we're looking for kind of a path for the parties in the conflict to kind of find the alternative and continue with the fight. And I think this is especially important now because, in my mind, the risk of escalation is very, very high. Uh, one of the things, the social problems that I'm quite worried about is not only about you know Russia is adopting its it, it, it's adopting different tactics now in fighting the war in Ukraine from what the way in which they began the war, and is transitioning towards kind of a more typical way that Russia fights its war, which is kind of a heavy emphasis on tanks against cities, and that's I think what we've seen in the east, and I think increasingly we've seen that throughout the rest of the evening. But the thing that especially worries me beyond that is the risk of an escalation that might bring a wider conflict that could conceivably expand into a conflict. And there are a few kind of paths where that could actually occur. So, you know, right now, US and its NATO allies are providing enormous amounts of military support to the Ukrainian military. Much of this is flowing through Poland. So, one of the dangers could be, you know, at some point in time, as this, as these supplies continue to flow in and as Russia continues to pay heavy costs from this invasion, that Russia might decide to interdict a convoy coming across from Poland and not intending to set off a wider conflict. But then, mm -hmm. Michael, just one second. Could you, could you speak to the mic? Because people are oh, yeah. hearing you on the, on the Zoom. Uh, yeah, so the, the worry would be is that loud enough? The worry would be that uh, Russia might engage in an activity that would sort of set in motion a much wider conflict uh, that would involve NATO. Just last week, uh, four Russian jets violated Swedish airspace, which actually doesn't happen all that uncommonly. But in the context of this war, a mistake like that could set in motion a wider war. And so this is why people are looking for an off ramp, a way in which this conflict might come to an end. And kind of the requirement for an off ramp like this is for the parties to believe that there's some sort of negotiated settlement that makes them better off than the status quo of the fighting right now. And I think that this is what creates kind of the real problem in Ukraine, because in a lot of ways it's really hard to see what that off ramp looks like right now, particularly for Vladimir Putin. As Dr. Yashama pointed out, in a lot of ways this conflict seems very, very personal to Putin. And to the degree to which he is essentially kind of put all of the stakes on the table and really kind of put his reputation and the Russian military on the table, it seems really, really hard to see a solution that otherwise creates kind of that off-ramp or kind of that space-saving mechanism where Putin can go home and claim victory and yet the war comes to an end. And I think one place that we can actually kind of see where this kind of creates problems are kind of loose talk like we saw over the weekend where we saw U.S. senators suggest maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to see uh, President Putin assassinated. Maybe that would be a good development. And that's a good example of the kind of language that would make it much, much harder to find an off ramp from this conflict. I think another thing that kind of adds some kind of this complexity in terms of locating that, that off ramp is I think in a lot of ways, in the way in which we're talking about in the West, we're kind of thinking about the end state of the conflict as a US NATO negotiation with the Russians. Ukraine is fighting right now on the ground. Uh, but in a lot of ways, we're kind of thinking about what is it, what do we have to give the Russians to satisfy them? So I've seen proposals that, you know, maybe handing the Russians the Donbass, maybe that would be enough to, to settle the conflict. And that might have actually been a solution a few weeks ago. But I think now that the conflict has occurred, I think it's important to recognize that the Ukrainians are part of the negotiating process. And so any off ramp has to not only be accessible to the Russians and to the Americans and to the rest of NATO. But most importantly, we'll have to be acceptable to the Ukrainians. And it's kind of hard for me to see that right now. And Dr. Greg, we still can't hear. Could you maybe stand up here sure. and just speak directly to the microphone, please? So I think the, the big issue that I would see too in, in terms of kind of preventing that off ramp is that it's really hard for the parties to, to sort of find what we would refer to as a credible commitment. The ability to make a commitment to some sort of an agreement that they could expect that the other side would live up to. So from the Russian side, if they're going to agree to something, un, invariably they're going to ask for something like a, an unaligned Ukraine, you know, a, a Finlandization like we've heard to refer to, or some sort of non-aligned Ukraine. 
But it seems really, really hard to see a way in which Ukraine is going to be able to agree to that because, of course, under the Budapest, the Budapest Memorandum, Ukraine had already sort of seen the great powers sort of pledge to observe U Ukrainian sovereignty. And Russia has violated that. So it seems really, really hard to imagine Ukraine agreeing to anything that is not going to provide them some further protection down the road. From the Russian side, even if Ukraine were to agree in the moment that we won't join NATO, maybe we won't join the European Union, both of which seem really hard for me to envision, but even if Ukraine were to agree that now, there's still this problem of what we refer to as the time inconsistency problem, which is that even if agreement, even if Ukraine, the Ukrainian agreement leadership agrees to this in the moment, there's no reasonable expectation for the Russian government that Ukraine will believe that nine months from now, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, which in a lot of ways brings us right back to where we are now. So in a lot of ways, that off-ramp that I think is really, really important, I'm pretty wary that there's a lot of opportunity, at least in the near term, to find that because of the incentives that are before the parties. And I think the last point that I'll make before I turn it over to the other panelists, I'm happy to expand in Q&A, is a lot of people have said, well, what about a mediator? What, is, what about bringing in a mediator? The challenge here is that major powers tend to avoid mediation of their conflicts. Major powers don't want mediators to enter into their conflicts. So it seems unlikely that the UN would be able to mediate this conflict or any other actor. The one carve out that I would describe though, for a third party that might actually be able to play a constructive role in this relationship is actually China. I wouldn't suggest China as a mediator in the way that we normally think about it, where China is gonna fly in President Zelensky and President Putin, and they're gonna meet in Beijing. But China is in a lot of ways in kind of a unique position. China has really significant business interests in Ukraine. At the same time, of course, we've seen sort of the emerging China-Russia axis that's occurred over the last year or so. And so there are a set of kind of embedded relations that when we look at third parties managing conflicts can be really kind of important. And China enjoys those. The other thing that puts China in sort of a unique position is we kind of, we've been kind of thinking about the way in which China benefits from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That in a lot of ways, anything that sort of ties up the Americans' interests and sort of limits the, the pivot to, to Asia that the United States has pursued over the last few years would seem to be in China's interest. But at the same time, China's broader interests are largely built around stability. You know, China is very different from Russia in that Russia is a great power that's sort of seeking to kind of foment chaos. The international order doesn't, in the Russian mind, doesn't really benefit the Russians. In a lot of ways, the international order benefits China in some really important ways. And so the one basic for, basis for some sense of, of optimism that I have is some ability for the Chinese to perhaps act as sort of a go-between and provide leverage and pressure points on the two sides that might create a window in the weeks to come for some sort of path towards something that would end this conflict. Thank you very much. How is it that ours is, is really poor right now? How does he make it work? I know that we're trying to have some sort of mediation with the Arabs and Russian. How to make the war go better? So involving Belarus? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would say Belarus, I, in a lot of ways, in a way which I would think about it, Belarus is essentially an extension of yes, Russia. Yes, more than anything. Yeah, that's that's yeah. right. <laughs> So Belarus has essentially become kind of the, the Western military district of Russia more than anything else. Any question in the back here? Um, what do you all uh, like, um, think about your Heimer's interpretation of the crisis? I don't think much of it. <laughs> I think it's just rooted in uh, high level theory without much evidence on the ground. So yeah, I think. Well, I, I think it's it's the first thing to reduce the tension a very power relation. So that's the most important and then not very close to the sun. That that's that's sort of it might sort of like a fundamental misunderstanding of what's happening in Russia. That would be my answer. I guess the only other thing I would add is I, I think Mearsheimer's perspective on the expansion of NATO doesn't reflect the way in which I think history has kind of recorded the expansion of NATO. Right. Frankly, I don't think that would motivate Putin at all. I mean, he would have accepted NATO and Poland and Romania and Bulgaria. It was Ukraine that was not acceptable. And, they, and there was no evidence that uh, NATO was going to expand Ukraine. In fact, most of the members would have not have, would have refused uh, Ukraine 
Their proof of concept was in the going up our about that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They work very effectively as our media tank during the battle of balance of power there. 